developments and challenges in the Ibogaine medical subculture. Some of the stories about Ibogaine's light and shadow are well known by now, at least in the realm of psychedelic research. However, in the past five years, and especially since the formation of the Global Ibogaine Therapist Alliance in 2009, the shape of the Ibogaine movement has started to transform significantly. The greatest testament to that is the fact that we are facing a different set of collective challenges. In this presentation, I will try to define some of these new edges of growth and discuss current developments. So Jonathan is an evil game provider, writer, and organizer with a long-standing passion for ceremony and the healing and inspirational qualities of visionary medicines. Since 2009, Jonathan has been helping to facilitate with Iboga in ceremonial and clinical settings throughout North America. <coughs> He organized the most recent gathering of the Global Ibogaine Therapist Alliance in Vancouver in October 2012. He currently sits on the board of directors of GIDA, as well as the board of Pangea Biomedics, an Ibogaine-assisted detox center based primarily in Miami, Mexico. And with that, I will introduce Jonathan Dickinson. It's always an honor to be here and be able to talk on behalf of um, this community that I feel really blessed to be a part of and uh, like, been so gracefully welcomed into. Um, I also feel like, I, well, I'm really glad anyways the way that I prepared this presentation. I think it's going to be quite general with my experience, but I'm glad that I did that now seeing that Ben has kind of given you some of the specifics about what has happened like in New Zealand in the past few years and um, what else did we talk about? Anyways, I'm just thinking really generally. My experience is I've been working in Ivy Game Clinics and I didn't come from a background of addiction. I came from a background of, well, I was depressed and I took psychedelics and they changed me when I was young. And I started to do a lot of research and got very inspired by the vision of Albert Hoffman and some of the psychedelic gurus about uh, psychedelic clinics and the way that those could be integrated into society and uh, offer a chance of, like, uh, to teach people more about meditation and yoga and uh, be incorporated into people's spiritual paths. So I came to Ivy Clinics feeling like they were a really grassroots model of that. They were starting to form and they were learning some of the lessons. They're kind of, it's kind of like the school of hard knocks, uh, but it is happening and it's been a really inspiring process to watch. So, um, so I'm assuming that most people who have heard about Ibogaine have heard about it either through news media, um, which Ben kind of gave a splattering of, or through people who have that kind of very polar view of it. It's either something that is a miraculous cure because it helped them a lot, or it's something that is quite dangerous and it's hard to understand what it's doing and it's hard to integrate into Western medicine. So I would like to just kind of complexify that a little bit and show that it, in the past few, years, because really it's only been a very short time that Ibogaine has been used in a clinical setting. Um, there have been a number of emergencies that have come up. People have had to be hospitalized when they're taking Ibogaine. There's been a number of fatalities that are associated with Ibogaine administration. But through that process, there's been a lot that's been learned. And we've been able to, as a community, as a um, as, like right now we're working on forming the Global Admin Therapist Alliance, which is essentially creating a forum for people to be able to share information about how treatments are happening and to be able to continue training after they've already been trained, to be able to train each other and show each other what they're learning. So, um, the first thing that I can say is a lot of the people that I've been learning from were formerly addicts came in through a process of initiation in a clinical setting. And at the same time that they started to learn about Ibogaine safety, they also were learning about addiction 101. And so one of the things that has become really apparent 
and is that detox itself is not easy and it's not safe. There's, um, especially with alcohol, uh, benzos, methadone, and any kind of ultra-rapid detox, there is a risk of death. Um, when there's improper care, in which is the case in a lot of even conventional medical settings, or when people are detoxing themselves outside of medical settings, there's a lot of risk factors that are unaddressed with or without ibogaine. So we've been able to see that even when ibogaine is being administered and those emergencies are coming up, most of the time, for I think yeah, all of the time. Um, sorry, I can't. Okay, all of the time there's either been pre-existing cardiovascular conditions, other substances of abuse being co-administered, um, seizures associated with alcohol or benzos, or any of another number of factors. There's been absolutely no evidence that ibogaine itself is neurotoxic. So, I'm kind of skipping around it, sorry for that, but um, I wanted to show this data too, this is something that uh, Ken Alper has drawn up, it's just to be able to show that um, Ibogaine, the, the fatalities that are associated with Ibogaine are fairly similar on par with other addiction treatments, and I think that all that I'm trying to get to here is that there's not necessarily a correlation between ibogaine fatalities and the dangers that have happened. Um, it is possible to be able to reduce the, the risk factors that are associated with ibogaine, and that's being handled in a really successful way. Um, these, these numbers that are up here, showing that there was 11 fatalities in 3,414 treatment episodes of ibogaine between 1989 and 2006 is, um, well that's based on that many treatment episodes, but we've been able to see that I think since then we're up to maybe like 10,000 treatments and there has been a significant reduction in the number of emergencies that have taken place and that's just because of the, the safety protocols that are being administered. And that, in my personal experience and with the, the clinic that I'm associated with, um, that hasn't looked <coughs> like bringing a lot more medical equipment into the fold. There's actually been a reduction in the amount of medical equipment and more time, just like taking more time with people, going slower, and being able to observe the process more carefully. So. Yeah, this is, this is what, I'm gonna, what I wanted to get to eventually was one of the, the big things that we're working on at Pangea and the director of the clinic there is Claire Wilkins is, um, I, don't, I don't know if you know in psychedelic therapy there's kind of two schools of thought. There's the there's psychedelic therapy which is offering really high doses with the intention of catalyzing some kind of mystical transformation um, and then there's psycholytic therapy, which is doing low doses over the court, like broken up over weeks, in conjunction with psychotherapy. Um, and so what Claire has been developing is, I've gone ahead and called it ibolytic therapy. And basically that looks like, I mean in a flood dose, the way that it happens is you, a lot of the times, traditionally, people come in on the plane and by the end of the evening, they're starting to go into withdrawals, and so people start doing like a test dose and building up a dose until by the end of the night, somebody's flooded. Um, with that being, they're having a really strong visionary experience, and they come out of that several days later, totally clean. That's the way that it appears in news media, of the popularized version of what an ibogaine treatment looks like. But with ibolytic therapy, um, that it looks a lot more like taking weeks taking a long time to sort of introduce somebody to the boga so they can feel how it works in their body, so they can be more engaged with the experience. Because it brings up a lot of kind of uh, mental process. And if you're able to see each of those ways that you think of something, the way that you grasp for um, onto ideas that you've held onto for a long time, if you're able to see each of those as a crossroads and kind of 
to make a turn consciously on your own and uh, kind of take baby steps into the experience, then it can be empowering in a totally different kind of way. Um, so the way that Claire is working is actually doing successive lower doses over the course of weeks, which builds up noradrenaline in the system. It allows adrenaline to collect in your body. And so the experience gets more intense very gradually. And over the course of that time, you can slowly lower the dose of opiates. So at a certain point, somebody's able to just completely walk off of the opiates that they were taking. And so like it says here, that involved, that's giving you know, people a chance to have a stronger personal engagement with the experience. It also gives a chance to be able to treat higher risk patients because a lot of people that can't take a flood dose of ibuprofen right away are able to do lower dose. And what we've been able to see is actually that if there are some of the pre-existing heart conditions that would be contraindicated with the flood dose, um, the lower dose is able to actually repair some of those that eventually somebody could take a flood dose. So, this is, this is a really interesting model for kind of understanding how everything works because I'm not a neuroscientist at all, but um, I know that even people who have looked into the neuroscience, it's kind of like a, a rabbit hole. It's really hard to describe exactly what's happening, what is the mechanism of action for how it's working. It's working on so many receptor sites at once. So one of the ICERS board members, Roman Pasculin, presented this at our last conference, and it was just this model of seeing ibogaine as increasing energy metabolism in the cells. And he's basically saying that the process isn't specific, no matter which species you're looking at, it's also not specific which type of cell you're looking at in the body, it kind of does the same process everywhere. And so basically, ibogaine is stressful on your energy metabolism, but so is an addiction. So, what he's saying is that when you when you take ibogaine, it's lowering your level of energy metabolism while you're doing it because you're so involved in the experience. But afterwards, your energy, energy metabolism is really high, which is why you're able to detoxify and reduce the tolerance. Um, you have a lot more energy to be able to um, feel good, and and your life goal is stronger. Um, you're able to be introspective and have insight into pathology, etc. Eliminate cravings. Um, but he's basically saying that if you do a flood dose after you've already detoxed, it's much easier on your system. If you're if you're at if you're taking it at the same time as you're coming off of your addiction, you're kind of compounding stressors on your energy metabolism, and that is reflected in like the cardiology, cardi cardiographic maps, and everything that people are looking at. So. The analytic therapy, it, it doesn't mean that you can't work with flood doses, it just means that building up to larger doses is, um, can be a lot safer and can actually like, do a lot of physical repair before you, before you go into the deeper spiritual realm. So it's nice for people to be able to access as well. So, um, one of the things that's happening right now is I'm seeing a lot of the providers that I've been learning from kind of branching out into doing other types of treatments. The current model has been treating multiple forms of addiction and then psychospiritual growth. Um, and a lot of providers kind of joke that psychospiritual is, it's not their favorite thing to do, but um, because they see that everybody in some form or another has an addiction or some some form of mental grasping. Like, I guess normally when you talk about addiction, the many forms of addiction, they fly. There's alcohol, drugs, um, sex or relationships, codependency, there's money, gambling, and alcohol, or tobacco, sorry. So those are the big five. But then even if you're able to get past any of those, at a certain point, you have to be able to deal with like negative self-thoughts <coughs> or patterns that keep you from moving forward deeper on a spiritual path. So, for most of the people that I'm learning with, they see those psycho-spiritual patterns as, a, as the exact same process because they're, that's their mirror, that's their reflection. But um, there's also been a lot of anecdotal interest in using IVH to treat neurological disorders for the exact same reason that it increases energy metabolism in your cells. So, for example, I've seen one guy come down for a heroin detox, and afterwards he was completely all of his symptoms of his 
correct that had since he was a child or completely removed and have been for the past three years. Um, there's also anecdotal evidence that it's helpful with Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. And for different psychological disorders, there's a huge epidemic of people being overprescribed as SSRIs, et cetera. And I mean, it can be really helpful for all of those things. So there's kind of a, a branching out happening. So, like I said, what I've been what I've been working on is just kind of, for the most part, just sitting and listening to people that are doing treatments. I've been watching treatments happen. I've been talking with people that have been through treatments, um, and currently starting to just like record the stories of the providers and kind of map their healing trajectory, and to be able to kind of create a forum for people to come and and share and. Um, deal with collectively with some of the problems. I, I know like individually people have found a, a niche to be able to provide treatments and run a business. And now there's issues coming up like um, the sustainability of the plant in Gabon is being threatened. Um, and there's um, a lot more work to do with now that IV research is expanding so broadly, like how do we develop training programs so that the safety information that's been gathered so far can be propagated effectively. So that's why we're, one of the reasons why we're starting to build into it. But it's, there's really interesting problems and that, um, you know, are going to take some uh, creativity to be able to, to solve. But that's because it's really hard to go into the community with the model of a professional organization because you have this really broad spectrum of people who are coming from African spiritual traditions to people who are on the cutting edge of allopathic medicine. And everywhere in between there's some um, like lay providers who have been self-initiated and who have dealt with their addiction and have various levels of training or no training at all when they're starting to offer treatments. So in, within the community we're starting to initiate a program um, like uh, bringing people into the fold of membership of and trying to figure out how we can provide that training. So, yeah. So I already, I just kind of mentioned this. So I'm just kind of bouncing around. But, um, yeah, one of the, some of, some of my friends down in Sampancho have started to say that it's almost as interesting, the idea of looking at Ibogaine as an addiction interrupter is almost a byproduct of the initiation that it's catalyzing. I'm just going to be able to see that it's, it's kind of clearing away for some of these spiritual paths to be able to take off. But within that, it's, there's, there's a lot happening. Like being able to bridge a jungle African religion with the cutting edge of Western medicine is something really special. There's something really sacred just in the fact that it's doing that. And so the whole spectrum of people in between is, it's, it's kind of like uh, stepping stones along a bridge. So, but seeing it, seeing its qualities as a strange attractor is really interesting. It's always really beautiful to see the the, um, the spectrum of people that come even around treatments at the exact same time. And its ability to just kind of bring synchronicity into a space where sometimes it feels like um, we're doing kind of like psychedelic medicine in the in the trenches of the drug war offering treatments, so, but it's really interesting and beautiful to see all the cool synchronistic alignments and the way that ceremony kind of like naturally happens, the way that people naturally get um, drawn into seeing that kind of magic that happens in life. So like I said, sustainability is one of the, the biggest questions that's coming up because um, between 1989 and 2006, I believe the figure was 3,000. 400 or so treatments that have happened, and that was a fourfold increase from the five years before that. Since then, it hasn't been exactly that dramatic of an increase, so it's not necessarily exponential, but if, if we go with the estimate that there's been 10,000 treatments now in 2013, then it's been at least a threefold increase since that figure was published. So it's growing really quickly. Um, it's made the plant incredibly valuable in Africa. So even in Gabon, where it's now illegal to export it, it's illegal to harvest it and, and ship it outside of Gabon. Um, DHL has a, a block on being able to send the plant. 
um, there's still such a value in, in a place where there's a lot of poverty often, especially in the jungle villages that are being infringed upon by forestry companies and other influences. It's a, it's a huge temptation and, and, well, a need in their community to be able to, to capitalize on, on the value that it's been given. So a lot of the, the plants in Gabon are being taken into Cameroon and then shipped from there. And we're starting to hear from communities there that it's actually becoming harder and harder for traditionalists to be able to find access to the plant. So it's really kind of sad and disturbing to be able to hear that. And I think that trying as much as possible to be able to see that there needs to be a bridge. There doesn't, there doesn't just need to be developed in a medical setting. There needs to be a bridge be able to honor and value um, the traditional culture and the ceremony from which it's coming from so that we can give back with the resources that we have and, and use some of the resources like with um, crop replacement programs or, or other ways to be able to plant more, more trees. Um, but I, I don't know, personally, I think that would be a really interesting thing to be able to see farmers given incentives to stop growing poppies and coca and start growing in boga or, or other medicines. Um, and I think that the way that we do that is first and foremost to see iboga as a sacred plant medicine and that means and that, that needs to be protected. There's other methods of addressing sustainability. For example, there's a, a gentleman from New York who goes running a lab in India that is starting to produce ibogaine from Boakanga, and then it's being semi-synthesized from Boakanga into ibogaine. So it's coming from another plant resource that's already grown agriculturally and is much more widely available, and you're able to produce ibogaine hydrochloride from it, which is like the most refined type of extract that people use. But in ibogaine treatments, that's used occasionally, it's considered like one of the tools in the tool set. We have like the root bark, which is just the raw material that you saw in the pictures that Ben showed that are harvested straight from the plant. Um, you have total alkaloid, which is an extract that contains all 12 or 15 of the alkaloids that are in the plant. And ibogaine hydrochloride is just ibogaine. So it's nice to be able to see that there's other solutions to be able to address the sustainability, and that's a really important solution for now to be able to have that ability. But in the long run, um, we need to be able to kind of tap into that um, that resource of just more people coming and putting creative energy into how to solve the issues that are coming. So that's my project. Is I really I feel like because I didn't come to the Ibogaine community with an addiction. Um, I didn't go and do a flood dose right away. I still haven't, I feel like, been fully initiated. Um, I've kind of been like a kid in, in the village that you see in Africa and like little doses along the way so that I understand how to be with people and how I can relate to the, the type of experience that people are having and definitely been powerfully transformed by being around it. But I still feel like I'm in the process of initiation, and part of the way that I've been integrating myself into that is just to kind of draw the community together and create a forum where I can like, sit with my my elders and learn from what they're doing and help them to be able to communicate together. So that's that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm also I'm still working around the treatments and uh, yeah. So I, because I, because I know a lot of people around the world that are working with it, I've been able to help people find their way to treatments and do referrals for people. Um, yeah, so it's kind of like if you were in Africa and you needed a, a detox, there would be um, somebody in the village that you could go to. If you needed an exorcism, there would be somebody else in the community that you could go to. And within the Ivy community, because it's such a spectrum, kind of also have access to that. You have people that are more specialized, maybe in dealing with methamphetamine treatments. Um, you have people that are more open to providing a ceremonial space, and you have really more strict clinical atmospheres that resemble conventional settings. So, so that's kind of what I've become aware of and I'm able to help people if, if you know anybody that needs treatment, kind of navigate that a little bit. So yeah, that's why I'm here. So thank you so much for
Oh, yeah. Um, so, hi, my name is Johnny Lorenz. I'm a member of the San Francisco Drug Users Union, and we're very interested in IVOGA as a treatment for, for people. But I, I'm interested about the uh, Ibogaine movement, especially in the treatment of addiction, as to how married um, the Ibogaine uh, movement is to, to, uh, to abstinence. Uh, in, that, in that, you know, if people who come for treatment for addictions, I mean, there's also the question of, like, how you define addiction. Yeah. Um, which is an interesting question for, for me and, and the people that I work with. Um, and that, is it okay for people who want to just take an addiction break? And that maybe don't want abstinence, uh, that, that maybe are just wanting to take a break from their particular drug of choice or, or their particular problematic uh, use. Yeah, totally. <coughs> yeah, there's definitely, I mean, there's a lot of compassion especially amongst the providers who were coming out of addiction, for that in particular. Mm -hmm. And it's really just to try to understand what your intention is and try to facilitate that. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, there's other types of community, like if you go into a 12-step community, and it's completely based on, on abstinence. But if you look back at, like, addiction wasn't even, I'm mean, just quoting my last conversation with Dimitri now, but addiction wasn't even a, a thing in society until like early in the 1900s when capitalism and materialism was becoming mm -hmm. you know, kind of the predominant paradigm. Mm -hmm. And AA was kind of providing people with a totally different community that was outside of that. You know? So you're, you're connected with people on a totally different type of brotherhood, sisterhood, and you like, can call someone up at four in the morning and your relationship isn't based on any kind of financial or material concerns, it's based on a spiritual bond that you have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Ibogaine addresses that in another really interesting way. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a ceremonial tool from Africa. You know, and it kind of, so, yeah, I don't think, like, seeing addiction as a, as a problem with, like, a substance that you need to remove yourself from, it's still seeing it in a materialist paradigm. And it's not necessarily, I think a lot of people are starting to see, like I said, that it's kind of the byproduct of the deeper initiation that you're going into. So you can still go and, and be initiated and do a lot of personal work without needing to stop. I mean, it's there for people who really want to stop and really want to feel away from them, but I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I was wondering if you do a little comment on whether you use the next sort of I'm not the best person to ask, but I've recently just been made to understand that I've got a kind of like that. Yeah. So that's not the same question. Yeah. Um, I've been very interested in actually taking some of the stuff I've had a lot of fun for many years. Um, I actually can't travel, so I mm -hmm. came upon some of them myself. I was wondering where to get the information on like the body, like how much your body weight is, and how much you should actually take. Because I've been kind of having a hard time finding that. Yeah. What can I find the information that I should get from So the way that a lot of providers are doing their treatments is by, it's not necessarily such a mathematical operation, it's really by watching okay. your body and how you respond to it. Do I need medical attention there, 100%, or just a buddy? Um, like a buddy, it depends on how much you feel like your buddy would be able to do if you're going to have an emergency. My friend you know, like having somebody there is not that useful unless they at least know how to get you there. I mean, this is like the last line of defense, you know, yeah. but I would recommend just talking to a bunch of providers and trying to, you know, let them know your situation and try to understand as well what you can do. But I mean, it, it's not possible for you to travel even to Mexico. I lost my passport. I got a
Well, folks, uh, that have to be it for now, so we can stay on our schedule. But we will have a panel discussion at the end, and you can address more questions to Jonathan and the rest of us then. Jonathan, thank you very much.